Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. This here electronic engineering podcast brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. This week, my friends, I am happy to announce that Meng Chiang, EVP and Dean of Engineering College at Purdue University, is joining me. And we're talking about the new Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue University. Meng and I are chatting about the multi-layered connection between technology and freedom and how this new tech tank will build a bridge between the worlds of technology and diplomacy. But first, it's time for a little news you may have missed. So why do we do what we do? Can we hack into that reward system hidden in our brains that makes us work harder and take risks in order to achieve our goals? Well, a team of researchers from the National Institute for Quantum and Radiological Science and Technology in Japan seem to think so. So, in order to hack this evolutionary mechanism found deep in our brain and help those who have reward systems in their brains that have been impaired, like those of us who suffer from depression, schizophrenia, or Parkinson's disease, we need to study the critical questions surrounding benefit and cost-based motivation. And this was exactly the motivation behind this recent study at the National Institute for Quantum and Radiological Science and Technology. Dr. Yukiku Hori explains it like this. Mental responses such as feeling more costly or being too lazy to act are often a problem in patients with mental disorders, such as depression. And the solution lies in the better understanding of what causes such responses. We wanted to look deeper into the mechanism of motivational disturbances in the brain. So, how did this team go about studying the mechanisms behind motivation? By looking at dopamine receptors in macaque monkeys. And specifically, they were looking to unlock two mysteries of two different classes of dopamine receptors. The D1-like receptor, which is D1R, and the D2-like receptor, or D2R, and their role in the development of benefit and cost-based motivation. So, how did they go about doing this? Well, this team of researchers first trained these monkeys to perform work delay tasks and reward size tasks. These tasks allowed them to measure how perceived reward size and required effort actually influenced the task performing behavior. And then they offered the monkeys the chance to perform tasks to achieve rewards and noted whether the monkeys refused or accepted to perform the tasks, paying close attention to how quickly they responded to the cues that were related to the tasks. Dr. Minimumoto, the corresponding author of the study, further explains their process like this. We systematically manipulated the D1R and D2R of these monkeys by injecting them with specific receptor binding molecules that dampened their biological responses to DA or dopamine signaling. By positron emission tomography based imaging of the brains of these animals, the extent of bindings or blockades of the receptors was measured. And what they found was pretty interesting. That decision making based on perceived benefit and cost required the involvement of both the D1R and D2R receptors. They also found that dopamine transmission through D1R and D2R receptors actually regulates the cost based motivational process. But workload discounting? The process of discounting the value of the rewards based on how much effort is needed was only related to the manipulation of the D2R receptor. Professor Horry sums up the study like this. 
the complementary roles of two dopamine receptor subtypes that our study revealed in the computation of the cost-benefit trade-off to guide action will help us decipher the pathophysiology of psychiatric disorders. So, has this new research cracked the code of motivation? Maybe not completely, but the day may come that we can manipulate our inbuilt reward system and enhance our motivational levels. And I'm all for it. All right, and now it's time for something completely different, a deep dive into the intersection of technology and diplomacy with Meng Chiang. Let's go. Hi, Meng. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, great to be here. Thank you, Amelia, for having me. Okay, so we're talking about the launch of the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue University today. So first, can you give me some background on this tech tank? Mung, what were the motivations behind its creation? Well, thank you, Amelia. Technology, we now have realized, is the new frontier of international relations. And it's a bidirectional relationship. On the one hand, you've got technology that is defining diplomatic matters. And then on the other hand, diplomacy is also influencing the development and deployment of technologies. And that's what motivated us here to create this new independent nonpartisan think tank, what we call America's first tech tank, to focus exclusively at the intersection between technology and foreign policy. Okay, so Meng, can you describe a bit more what will be the main focus of this Center for Tech Diplomacy? Mm -hmm. Well, we think that tech diplomacy requires engagement with the private sector, with engineers, and with like-minded nations and their tech companies. So we will be looking at convening meetings and carrying out studies alongside the private sector in technology areas, alongside engineers, alongside like-minded nations. And when it comes to the choice of topics, Amelia, there are many important emerging and critical technologies that are shaping foreign policy discussions today. We're going to start with three focus points. One is semiconductors, one is 6G, and one is artificial intelligence, AI. And then we're going to go into additional topical areas, uh, such as uh, manufacturing supply chain, robotics, autonomy, digital currency. They're all very important to advance freedom and to uh, safeguard national security. What are the goals of this new tech tank? We believe that technology must advance freedom and advance human dignity, advance democracy, and advance sustainable prosperity. So our hope is that as a independent think tank, we will contribute to the thinking and the education of the way that this country and like-minded nations will be going through the coming decades of tech intersecting with foreign policy. In particular, we hope that uh, we can provide useful inputs to policymakers when it comes to these topics like semiconductor chips, like 6G development deployment, like data sharing protocols for artificial intelligence, and will be a useful conduit between the U.S. foreign policy organizations and the private sector and community of engineers here in the U.S. and in like-minded partners. So you guys have an inaugural event hosted by the CTDP very soon. So can you tell me more about this event? Yes, we're excited to have semiconductors as the topic for the first event. It will be a hybrid mode And I'm glad that, Amelia, you just asked me here today because we are about to send out the RSVP. It's going to be held, actually, on the margins of UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, in New York City on September 21st and 22nd. And one can register for the online participation 
we will have a round table that I will moderate with technology leaders and foreign policy leaders on the 21st to talk about the semiconductor global supply chain and how to strengthen that. And then we will have on the 22nd of September, a fireside chat whereby uh, Keith Kroc, the chairman of our advisory board, will be interviewing uh, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel, who started it back in February this year and has been making many major announcements when it comes to Intel's strategy for semiconductors manufacturing. Uh, So it's going to be very exciting. And we'll have Purdue President uh, Mitch Daniels also kick it off of this fireside chat on the 22nd. And after this event in October, we'll have another hybrid event that's not synchronized with uh, UN General Assembly meetings. It will be a bi-coastal event in October. We'll announce the date soon. Part of that will be in Silicon Valley, hybrid mode. The other part will be in Washington, D.C., hybrid mode. And it's kind of interesting to see that uh, we are here in the Midwest, in the state of Indiana here, and it is sort of the bridge connecting the two coasts and uh, connecting two very different environments of the Silicon Valley tech environment and the Washington, D.C. policy environment. And the October event will be focusing on collaboration with EU and Japan and Australia and UK when it comes to critical technology R&D. As you know, the US is making a lot of investments and so are many of those countries and groups of countries. So we're going to have a really good conversation in October about that. That's fantastic. Now, Meng, where do you see the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue University headed in the future? First of all, tech diplomacy is something relatively new. We've had science diplomacy and economic statecraft for many decades. Science diplomacy, some of the primary topics since the end of the World War II have been nonproliferation, have been super collider collaboration, being climate science. And these days, we see that topics such as chips and 5G, now 6G, AI, autonomy, they are increasingly intertwined with foreign policy. So we hope that CTD at Purdue will be able to help advance the conversation among many stakeholders on this relatively young emergent pillar of international relations, namely tech diplomacy. And second is that we hope to provide capacity uh, with the private sector and engineers community for the US government's foreign policy organizations, including the Department of State, USAID, and many other agencies, uh, so that there will be a lot of talent who will be interested in and capable of going through uh, the policy discussions on technology topics. And third and last, we hope that as it is a two-way street, we can also bring more understanding of foreign policy to the civilian world, uh, including the tech companies, large and small, including our students and professors and other engineers who might otherwise not have been given the chance to appreciate the intricacy of foreign policy that are now increasingly influencing technology development in return. So we hope that we can achieve all of those goals. We hope we can be a useful tech tank to advance freedom through technology and tech diplomacy and provide training to U.S. diplomats. That is fantastic. All right, Mung, it is time for your off-the-cuff question now. Ah. A a lot of us have been on lockdown on one level or another, and we can't get our favorite foods. So, Mm. Mung, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if you have to get a passport to get there. The restaurant Mm. is closed. It's across the United States. What would you have? Ice cream. Undoubtedly, there, there is one singular answer on my mind, Amelia, and that is ice cream. And let me be specific, uh, not do. any ice cream, but uh, 
I would imagine either affogato, which is with espresso drowning gelato, or it could be a good old style American float. Prefer to have the Coke, not the Diet Coke,、uh-huh. and I prefer to have vanilla or chocolate flavor ice cream in that Coke. So I know a few places that are very good here at Purdue, and I know a few West Coast, East Coast places that are very good. At creating this、uh, blend of outstanding、uh, culinary uh, treat, uh, uh-huh. but you know, food, including the ingredients that go into the making of ice cream and coffee and coke, they are actually part of tech diplomacy. I'm not trying to just wrap every question back to tech diplomacy, but yes, food security, food supply chain, and the manufacturing of food、uh, that goes around the world that is part of Diplomacy, and it does rely on advancement of technology. So, tech diplomacy is everywhere, even in my favorite food, ice cream. <laughs> I love it, and you are absolutely right, Mung. I loved how you brought that all together. That is fantastic. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Amelia, for having me. Take care. And before we go, don't forget to check out my brand new maker-themed monthly fish fry podcast called Makers Today. In our second episode, launched last month, I chat with Lorraine Underwood about the hashtag Badass Women Makers and Engineers project at Element 14, the cool projects she has created, and why she wrote the book Save the World with Code. And a brand new episode of this series is launching on August twenty fourth, and you won't want to miss that one. And hey, if you're a maker and you'd like to be featured on this new series, please let me know. You can send me an email at amelia at eejournal dot com, send me a message on LinkedIn, or carrier pigeon. You know, whatever works best for you. And hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com/eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you want to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. nineteen seventy eight. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow me or us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, YouTube.com/eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by yours truly. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's fish frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice, and five stars, please. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's fish frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, or heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of August twenty second, twenty twenty one, I'm Amelia Dalton. And you've been fried.